could have missed the fact that there's a new king. And in the process, we're seeing the reassertion of very old-fashioned monarchist values. There are moves towards increasing royal power. Legislation has been passed effectively outlawing protests. People were arrested just for bringing Republican posters on May the 6th. Posters which said, not my king. They were arrested for having a van with such posters. And these measures were brought in by His Majesty's ministers, explicitly overruling Parliament, who had voted down these measures. They were brought in through ministerial order. I had in my last video talked about how future moves to digital currency effectively assert greater crown power against the old bourgeois financial order that was introduced in the um, essentially the 17th, uh, the 18th century. And we've had the partial restoration of the crown estate to the person of the monarch, a transfer of what had effectively been public property to become crown, crown personal property again. Now the crown estate is the publicly owned lands and mineral rights in Britain. They have an income of 312 million last year and are reckoned to have around 16 billion worth of total assets. This process whereby 25% of that is handed to the king is very recent and it's a big retrogression from the early days of bourgeois power following the Glorious Revolution. In 1793 the crown had effectively forfeited this estate to the Exchequer in return for the civil list which was a vote in Parliament each year to give a quantity of money to the king which made the king financially subordinate to Parliament. The Cameron government has reversed this and it handed back 25% of the Crown estate to the monarchy personally. Effectively shifting, ideologically at least, it from being public property to the private property of the king. In addition the monarchs control royal duchies, the royal duchies of Lancaster and Cornwall, which they somehow managed to evade handing over to the Crown Estate in 1793. The land and business of these duchies produced about 50 million for Charles in 2020. Um, it's dropped slightly as a result of the pandemic. But as you see from this graph, it's been a very rapidly rising profitable business and that is in constant 2022 prices it's not unadjusted and on top of that he's got a bunch of palaces an absurd number of palaces i've just listed the valuation of the top nine palaces He's a bunch of other ones, including one in Scotland called Falkland Palace, which apparently no member of the royal family has bothered to stay in for over 200 years, still maintained. If you look at the values of these in terms of current property values, values given by estate agents for what these buildings would sell for and what they would rent for at current market prices, his, his top nine palaces are worth three and a half billion pounds. And these would fetch about 85 billion a year if they were rented out at current rental values. But of course, the royal family live in them rent free. So that, under His Majesty's own 
Inland Revenue's standards, if you are provided with a building rent-free, that is income in kind. Now, if we add up all this, there's three and a half billion of palaces. The, he effectively has 25% of the Crown Estate, which is just under four billion. Duchy of Cornwall is reckoned to be worth a billion. The Duchy of Lancaster, 650,000. In addition, crowns, jewels, works of art, diamonds, etc., apparently about 500 million. So, looking at the things I could find figures on, I get his wealth to be just under 10 billion and an income from that wealth of around 200 million a year. Let's put that in proportion. In terms of income, the king gets as much as eight and a half thousand of his average subjects at an average uh, UK income. And suppose one of his subjects wanted to save up enough to become as rich as the king. When would they have had to start saving? Well, they'd have had to start at about four million years BC if they were saving 10% of their income to become as rich as the king. Now you hear around the time of the coronation a whole lot of royalist propaganda arguments to the effect that the crown country makes a profit from the king as the exchequer gets 25% of the crown estate revenue. And that's a bit rich. The crown estate is just publicly owned land. As such, its revenue used to go to the exchequer and reduce the general tax. So, until the Cameron government came in, there was no question that was public revenue. And suddenly, after the Cameron government hands 25% of that to the Queen, it appears that the Queen is subsidising, or the King is then subsidising the country with the remaining 75% rather than the country subsidising the king. Another argument you commonly come across is that the monarchy brings in millions in tourism. Well, I, Statistica said it brings in 550 million in tourism. Well, there's a naive reply to this. The French don't have a king. They famously got rid of theirs. And if you plot French tourism revenue against British tourism revenue, you see that the French are actually doing somewhat better. Having the royal palaces like Versailles and the Louvre available as art galleries seems to do pretty well for, for tourism. But there's a more sophisticated response to this. When tourists come here and spend money, they spend the money on meals, rail transport, hotel, accommodation, etc. The tourists are paying for what they consume. That is an equivalent exchange. It's not a gift. They're getting something in return. They're getting a meal. They're getting carried in a train. They're getting their hotel bed made. All of that is being provided not by the king, but by catering and transport workers. The king is not doing shifts in hotels or train stations. 